Let's look together in 1 Thessalonians 5. I want to read for you from verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. I want to speak with you in this message on why we as Christ's people are different. You notice in this portion of scripture, the Apostle Paul, and really the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul is drawing a line of distinction between the children of light that he calls here the children of the day, which makes sense. If who we are, we are in Christ. He's the son of righteousness, son that rises with healing in its wings. And all that we are, anything good that can be said of us is a reflection of who Christ is. That's really who we are as children of light. And so uh, the exhortation here, as we saw in verse 6, is not to sleep as do others, as do the others. It's not talking about children of light sleeping, but as do those who are children of darkness. But let us watch and be sober. So you can see there's a very clear distinction made between children of light and children of, of darkness. You know, having spent this past week uh, doing some substitute teaching over at Southwood. It uh, kind of threw me back into my days as a, in high school, thinking about, you know, what it was to stand alone. I like to watch people anyway, and it just has been fascinating to me to watch kids and how they, you know, how they act and how they try to, some of them stand alone. They don't care what anybody thinks. And some, you know, you can tell they're just trying to be in the in crowd, trying to be like everybody else. And as I thought about that, I thought about how we live in this world. We're called to stand alone. We're called upon to stand alone, not to try to be like this world and not to be embarrassed for being different. <laughs> Kids are tough on each other. They, they'll try to make you feel badly because you're different than somebody else but we might as well mark it up we are different we've been made so by the grace of god and that is not a bad thing that is a good thing so i would encourage all of us i know it, it, sometimes it gets tiresome standing alone it gets wearisome it just seems like we're just swimming against the current and we are as far as this world is concerned. But what a calling, what a calling. If you look over in 1 Peter chapter four, if this can be of some help to us, we're not alone. We have examples in scripture and exhortations here to encourage us. As you see here in Verse 1 of 1 Peter 4, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. What makes the difference? Well, it's what Christ has done for us. We, would not, we wouldn't be any different in the world if it hadn't been for Christ and his death and, and the, the effect of that death and the Spirit calling us out. So arm yourselves likewise. And, and you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but we sang battle songs tonight. <laughs> And he was probably sitting there thinking, why are we singing these? Well, arm yourself. That's, that's what this is about. Uh, likewise, how? With the same mind. So we're going to see that one of the biggest differences, and really this is my first point here, is our mindset is different. Why are we different? Our mindset is different. 
You have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? Well, we've been given the very spirit of Christ to think on things of God, to even be able to read the scriptures and know and understand something that pertains to salvation in Christ. And so it says, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. You notice it says, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's Christ. He came once to bear the sin of his people. And that sin has been removed. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. So even as he that suffered in the flesh, Christ has ceased from sin, the implication is that we also, knowing who Christ is, no longer live to the lusts of flesh, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. I like the way that's put. Didn't we? <laughs> it, the time that we were in this world and in darkness, doesn't that suffice? Doesn't To think back again to living that sort of lifestyle in darkness, is there anything appealing? Is there anything there that would draw your heart back to it? Why? It says here, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. That's just the sum of the whole thing. It's just abominable idolatry, living for self. But now here, look in verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They're going to mock you. They're going to speak evil of you because you don't run with the crowd. But I'm telling you, it's a blessing not to run with this, this crowd, whether in the secular world or in the religious world. <laughs> Thank God we're not running with that crowd. God's made a difference. So come back here to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 8 through 11. Having said that, what makes us different? Well, as I already said, the first thing I'd have you to consider is that we've been given a different mindset. Have you been given a different mindset? In those who are yet in darkness, as they're described here in, in verse 4, we saw this last time, but ye brethren are not in darkness, but no, there are multitudes that are in darkness. What does that mean? No light. They've not been given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. They're lost. Now they still might, some still might be those for whom Christ died, but until the Spirit of God gives them light, they're in darkness. And being in darkness, they have a mindset of those that they're described here as those that sleep or those that are drunken. You see that in verse 7? They that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. It's, isn't it amazing that this is when most of this goes on physically in the world? <laughs> you know, a nighttime where a lot of the evil is done. And yet, I believe that there's a sense here that's beyond that in verse 7. Sleepfulness here is in a spiritual sense. A stupor of mind. You know what it's like to be sleepy. I mean, you could be, you could fall asleep at the wheel and, and be heading off the road and, and wouldn't know it. You're unaware of, of the danger. And that aptly describes our souls, isn't it? Until God gives us light, we're unaware of the danger that our soul's in. Our mindset is to forget God and not even to dwell on spiritual matters. And quite honestly, even even when there's some manner of a spiritual conversation in our workplace, as we talk to people, it's pretty superficial. It's just, there's nothing real. If it gets too serious, you're going to find them scooting off. That's that sleepfulness. They're just, you know, you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden they're gone. That's, I believe, what is being described here. But drunkenness, again, think of the idea of drunkenness. What are they drunk with? Well, the idea of themselves, flesh, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all of these things that are enmity with God. But the contrast now, I want you to see in verse 8, because the, the point here is, why are we different? Well, we've been given a different mindset. What is our mindset? Well, one of a soldier, of battle readiness. Verse 8 says, but let us who are of the day be sober, 
and then there's a comma, putting on the breastplate. Well, who wore breastplates back in the day? Soldiers. Helmets. Who wore helmets? <laughs> Soldiers. I've talked to some acquaintances that have been over to Iraq and come back, and, and I was talking to one who's a coach. I was refereeing a game, and he, was, he had just been back from Iraq for less than a week, and he was trying to coach some high school kids, but he said, you find yourself constantly looking around to the trees, constantly thinking where snipers might be, <laughs> because for a year plus, that's the way he lived. He couldn't go anywhere without his armor on, without that helmet on. And he said, I feel naked right now. He said, I, you just can't describe how, how extreme a change is coming from a war zone back to, you know, just this peace and comfort. And I thought, you know, in this world, we're never to rest. I know our rest is in Christ, but at the same time, all the language pertaining to us as Christ's people mindset again that doesn't mean we're going to go out and dress up like soldiers to make a point but our mindset is different you know and when you talk about things that are that are serious with people of those with darkness don't they just kind of mock what what do you why is that so important to you do you really think it's that serious when we talk about men's souls and about being under the wrath of god and about the death of the lord jesus christ being the only ground and basis for God, you know, delighting in a sinner, people look at you real funny like, you know, that's, that's, you're just a fanatic. But it's a mindset. And that's what it's described here as sober-mindedness. So we have this, the sober-mindedness with regard to the gospel, sober-mindedness with regard to Christ, sober-mindedness with regard to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, sober-mindedness with regard to how God can be just and justify sinners. These are all serious matters for one that the Lord has taught. And having the breastplate of faith and love. You know, the breastplate, if you were to compare it to a modern illustration, it would be a bulletproof vest. That's what has developed out of a breastplate. Why does the armor over in Iraq, this has been such a big discussion, let's get these men the armor they need. <laughs> Well, it's because it's life and death. It's life and death. And one of the most crucial parts is, is the helmet and the breastplate. Why? Those are critical. It deals with a heart and a head. It's critical. And that certainly is the same with regard to, to salvation. The breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, as it says here, the hope of salvation. Which hope, dear friends, is, is nothing other than our Lord Jesus and his finished work for us. If you look over in 1 Timothy, just a page or so in your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 1, what, what is a true hope of salvation? What's well, the person of Christ and his work that he accomplished, that righteousness he wrought, worked out? You see how Paul writes Timothy here, Paul, the, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, and you notice which is is an italic. So just read it. And Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. <laughs> I like that, our hope. There is no hope apart from him. And, and what I'm reading here to you, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 6, Paul developed this at length with the Ephesians, this mindset. And what do you do with the mind? You think. You weigh, you study, you evaluate, you analyze. And it's all based upon truth. It's based upon what's revealed in this word. That this is where we take our stand. It's not with associations. It's not with denominations. It's not with the crowd. It's not with the masses. It's not even with desiring people to like us. We, we stand with the truth. That's what you do with the mind as God gives it to you. And you see here in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in who he is. Be strong in what he's revealed of himself. Be strong in that truth, that doctrine of Christ, and in the power of his might. We could never stand uh, with him against this world were it not for 
the power of his might, his spirit teaching us. But put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So again, a depiction here of warfare. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I would encourage you, again, to have this mindset. When, when someone gets up in your face over doctrine and over Christ and over the gospel, just remember, you're not wrestling with flesh and blood. They might think it that way. They might want to take you on. They might want to, you know, get you to react. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers. Here it is, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's what Christ said of the Pharisees. You're your father the devil. Why do men reason the way they do against the truth? Well, it's because they're under the influence of darkness against spiritual wickedness in high places. But you take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, all right? So you say, well, where do I stand? Well, look at here, it's very, very practical. Having what? Your loins girt about with truth. We stand with the truth. All else, you know, let God be God and every man a liar. So what is revealed here, we stand. All right, the truth. And having on the breastplate of what? Righteousness. Over there in 1 Thessalonians called the, the breastplate of faith and love. Well, what does is, what is true faith point us to? The righteousness of God in Christ. What is, what is it to truly love Christ? It's to love that righteousness that he wrought out on our behalf. A breastplate of righteousness is something you put on, isn't it? it it's, it's not in you, it's on you. That's what God has done in Christ. He has imputed unto us the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we take that out by bowing to it. We don't establish it by faith, but we bow to it by faith. As, as the Lord has revealed it to us, we, we gladly own it. We know it to be our only righteousness. And then verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, these are all objective things. Truth the doctrine of righteousness, the gospel of peace. What is that? Well, that's how peace has been established between God and the sinner. And that's where we find our peace, as the Spirit of God reveals it to us. It, what it is, dear friends, is a salvation that is conditioned on Christ alone. Christ alone. To which we give ourselves to learn and to analyze and to, to weigh. That's, that's the mindset. How, how God has been pleased to, to uh, accomplish his salvation. And verse 17 shows how it's revealed. It says, take the helmet of salvation. What's the helmet do? It covers the head. That, that's the mind. That's where our thought is. And it says, and the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. The word of God. We keep coming back to this word. That's why God has, has given it to us. So we have a different mindset. Secondly, if you come back here to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 9 and 10, we have a different calling. We have a different calling. In verse 9 it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You know, although we're certainly guilty, of the wrath of God. We're born certainly just as guilty of the wrath of God as anybody. And we have the same nature as those who are children of wrath. I think a lot of people confuse over here in Ephesians chapter 2 what Paul says here. We were never objects of wrath in the sense of vessels of wrath. And yet we deserve that wrath, and we're made to, to know and understand that by the Spirit of God. But here in Ephesians 2 and verse 3, it says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, that's important. It doesn't say, and were children of wrath, even as others, because you're either vessel of wrath or you're vessel of, of glory, vessel of honor. But by nature we are. When you consider who we are in Adam, 
we're just as deserving of God's wrath as anybody. But here in 1 Thessalonians 5, why hasn't God poured out his wrath on us? Well, it says God hath not appointed us to wrath. That was not our appointment. <laughs> and that's an interesting word there. Because salvation is by appointment. You notice, if you just read it the way it, it's all together, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. You could read it, for God hath appointed us to obtain salvation. Take the negative out of there. So that's why any of us are saved. And that's our calling. It's not anything in us. Salvation's by appointment. God has not, that word appointed means to place or to establish or to settle you in a permanent. You fill out an application sometimes and it asks what your permanent address is. <laughs> well, normally that means where you're living now. But the sense of this word, God has not appointed us to wrath, because in one sense we can say that we were under God's legal condemnation in Adam, weren't we? We fell in Adam. So in that sense, we were under wrath, but that wasn't a permanent dwelling. That wasn't our final dwelling. That wasn't, God has not, did not establish us in that wrath, but rather look to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to obtain salvation. In other words, to bear that wrath on our behalf. All right, so that's the sense here. God has not placed or established or settled us under his wrath, but to place us, and this is an interesting word, that word obtained literally means a purchased possession. That's the word. But appointed us to a purchased salvation. Now this is so vile, because I know God decreed it, but it was, it was an appointment unto a purchased salvation. It had to be wrought out by somebody. That satisfaction had to be made in order for God to be just and justified. And it tells us exactly how it was made. It tells us when it was made. It's not when you believed. It was, it says, who died for us. <laughs> that obtaining of that salvation, notice, by our Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't obtained by you. It wasn't appropriated by you. It was obtained by the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. I'll tell you, the reason we're not under wrath is not because we believed. See, a lot of people say that. Well, if you believe, then God will remove his wrath for you. The reason we're not under wrath is because that wrath was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason we believe is because that wrath was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where this matter was dealt with, dear friends. That's where it was settled. You notice in verse 9 where it says, who died for us. I know it's easy to read over these little words, but that F-O-R is substitution. Satisfaction. You know, to die means he actually accomplished something by that death. If you look over in Romans chapter 5, he redeemed us. This is where redemption took place. This is where satisfaction took place. Look in, in Romans 5 in verse 6. People like to make us think that somehow we were involved in this somehow. No, it was done before we were ever born. It says here for, in verse 6, Romans 5, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, in other words, according to the time is the way it is in the original. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son. At the time appointed, that's where our appointment, that's where our establishing took place in salvation. It was at the cross. And it says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet, what, sinners, Christ died for us. You see that? There's that substitution. It was a point in time. It's a, when God was pleased to take the sin of his people and put it upon his son and take his righteous obedience and put it to their account, their spiritual account. That took place when Christ died. That's where this, that's where this salvation was established and appointed and obtained, purchased. 
To die for means that what literally means that the merits of Christ's death were put to our account in such a matter that we were then and there justified before God. Uh, if you look, read on in, in, the, in the same passage in verse 9, Romans 5, much more than being now justified, how? By his blood, by his death. People don't like to hear that. They don't like to hear of, of sinners being justified before they believe. When the scriptures talk about justification by faith, you go back and read the context, it's, it's by the faith. It's by what is declared in the gospel that we're, we're declared just before God. That's the faith. And any believing is the consequence of what Christ accomplished. Being therefore justified, we have peace with God. By faith, we have peace with God. We, we enter into that, the peace that comes by faith, but the justification was in his death. As it says here, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved. What that means is we were saved from wrath in his death and will continue to be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. <laughs> You know what? I, I don't have any part in this. No, you were reconciled when you were still an enemy. Much more being reconciled. That's how, that, that means being reconciled by Christ's death. Between the Father and Son, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, and that word should be the reconciliation. We've now received it through the death of Christ but by the Spirit of God revealed, you see. So that's, we have a different calling. We have a different calling. And if you look in, in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 7, you know, to die for somebody, especially with regard to the death of Christ, and if you were to ask me what's the, the main difference between what we believe with regard to the death of Christ and what the majority of this religious world believes, we believe that Christ's death actually accomplished something. It actually did what he set it out to do. There's no hypothetical with regard to the death of Christ. There's no, no setting forth of Christ as a potential Savior. He is the Savior of those for whom he died. He has redeemed them. He has justified them. He has reconciled them to God. And that's why in time the Spirit is given that they might believe, that they might know it. Look here in, in Romans 6, and I, again, that this is a whole message in of itself. I know that many people interpret Romans 6, and I did for some time. The baptism here was water baptism. Now, there, there are certainly parallels, but if you look at the context, when it says here in verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. What he's showing here is our relationship to Christ when he died. Well, I wasn't even alive yet, but when he died, I was, what was that? Christ called his death a baptism of fire. And verse 4 says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death. In other words, when he died, I died. And it says that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. In other words, when he died, I died. When he rose again, I rose again. And therefore, it is evident that he's going to give his spirit unto those for whom he died, that they walk in that newness of life, that they be brought to spiritual life. For if we have been planted together, look at here, in the likeness of his death. I didn't actually die, but I was planted together with him. I died when he died. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We'll be given life. What, what is resurrection all about but life? Knowing this, here it is, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. What's that old man? Well, that's who we were in Adam. All of that condemnation in Adam, the old man, was dealt with in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now, stop and ask yourself, if, is it talking about anything in here? No, this, this body of sin is still very much alive. 
but that the body of sin might be destroyed. What body of sin was destroyed when Christ died? Well, it was imputed sin. It was the whole mass of sin. He was made, that word, the sense is he was made a mass of sin. That mass of sin was laid upon him in his death. That's by imputation. So that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, that we would not be under its bondage, that we would not be under its curse. And that's what Christ did by his death. He took it all away. He took it all away. Now here's, here's why I say this. Look at verse 7. For he that is dead. Now let me ask you. Are you dead to sin as far as its presence? No. I know and feel it just as, as much as I ever did. Right here. But he that is dead, it says, is freed from sin. What death is he talking about? He's talking about that death in the death of Christ. And that word freed, I don't know if you have no reading or not, but it says, he that is dead is justified from sin. That's the word in the original. It's the word declared righteous from sin. Wow, well, that's good news. Because when I suffer under it right now and know myself to be a sinner, and I, I, I begin to look within and think, what can I do? That's where I, that mindset has to change. I have to remember, no, this matter of sin was dealt with in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In him, I am justified from sin, declared righteous. That's what that word means. And now if we be dead with Christ, how, how are we dead with him? Well, when he died, I died. We believe that we shall also live with him. And that's really what Paul is saying over here uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 10. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. There's a hope. I'll tell you, that's, that's my hope. If I have to ask somebody, if they ask me, well, what makes you different? <laughs> what makes you so special? Well, it's nothing in me. It's what's been granted me, done for me by a great Savior. And would that God would show you who he is. <laughs> That's what we tell those who are yet in darkness. It's, it's, dear friends, salvation by any other condition is not the salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how it's put there in, in verse 9 of chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9? God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, how? By our Lord Jesus Christ, period. Who died for us. That's, that's where we keep coming back to. Who he is and what he did. Who he is and what he did. You know, uh, he, he died for the, to this end, that we should live with him. Now, we live by regeneration. There's no question. In, in, in the spirit, uh, scripture says the just shall live by faith. Those that have been justified shall live. They'll be caused to, to live by faith. But it's the faith of Christ, isn't it? Paul said Galatians 2.20, uh, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live how? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and what gave himself for me. Life is the consequence of him dying. That's why I believe. That's why I look to Christ. It's, it's his faith by which I, I live. But also I believe you can understand this in the sense of, of in that final resurrection. What is my hope of a final resurrection? Again, this is all in the context of Christ coming again. Well, by the resurrection of these mortal bodies from the dead, when he comes again, we shall live. I believe that. You know, Paul says whether, you know, whether we wake or sleep, I don't know whether I'll still be alive when Christ comes again or not, I, or sleep, I don't know whether I'll be dead, but one way or another, I'm going to live together with him. And that's a blessed, blessed hope. Well, one final point here, I know time's getting away, but what makes us different? Well, this third point I would say is we have a different fellowship than that of the world. Paul says in, in verse uh, 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Don't worry about this world not fellowshipping with you. We don't need it. We have each other. We have the fellowship of those that the Lord has been pleased to talk. That's what John said. He said, Our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Now, that's comforting. Especially when you find yourself walking alone. I do. Our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, whether we have any with this world or not. 
Don't get feeling like you've got to, you know, sidle up to this world. You don't. You know, we, we desire others to join us, but will not be drawn aside uh, into compromise by isolation. Someone wrote me this, this past and said we had a good time of worship even though our numbers were very slim. And I wrote them back and said, were, were they less than what Noah had in his day? <laughs> Eight in an ark. Oh, you can you imagine all? But they had the fellowship with each other by the grace of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Lot's crew was pretty motley when he got ushered out of Sodom and Gomorrah, wasn't it? <laughs> he lost his wife out of the deal. He ended up with just two daughters in, in himself. That's a pretty small fellowship when you think about it, but he was an object of God's mercy and of God's grace. Now, our goal in life is to, is to find those whose faith, hope, and love is truly in the Lord Jesus, not by mere lip service, but true persuasion of heart. Because I believe that's what the Spirit does. It gives the, the more we learn of Christ, the more we learn of his death, the, the more we're encouraged. As it says here, wherefore comfort. You notice the word comfort there is the word exhort yourselves together. That's what we're doing tonight. That's what I'm doing with you. Afterward, as we visit and talk, uh, about different situations of life. We, we're, we're here to exhort one another. And the word doesn't mean to put one down, but to build one, build one another up. Uh, exhortation, it's not just a touchy-feely thing. It's based upon truth. It's based upon what we know according to the word. And there we rest. Edify yourselves. How? You look over in Jude. This will be my last reference in Jude. It says in verse 20, there's only one chapter, but ye beloved, building up yourselves, how? On your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What's that most holy faith? Well, that's which glorifies Christ, who is holy. That which is our salvation. So we build ourselves up together, praying in the Holy Ghost, it's leaning upon the Lord and, and, the, and his spirit to teach us evermore keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for what? The mercy. We're not looking for merit. We're looking for mercy. The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. You see, this is the attitude toward, toward people. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's works religion. Why are we so... Why are we so ambitious about this why are we so fanatical <laughs> well it's because a, a garment spotted by the flesh is no garment at all it's no righteousness at all it'll damn multitudes and so just like you'd save somebody out of a, a burning house uh, you, you speak to we speak to each other in these terms it's christ alone untainted by the flesh now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. But just remember, if you have any standing, it's him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. How? In the righteousness of Christ imputed. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. I need you to encourage me in this. I, you know, <laughs> this, this is the, our only hope. I want to encourage you in it. That's how we comfort one another. That's how we build one another up. And uh, may the Lord grant us such a faith. All right.